It's not so much a game to me as it is a way of life. We weren't always like this. Sure, my family played growing up, but I actually stopped playing in college entirely. It wasn't until... It wasn't until the kids came. Right. We thought it'd be good for the kids. Dad, look. I got three stars! I do feel like I lost my sister a little bit. I mean, don't get me wrong, I play. I play once a couple, few times a year. Maybe around the holidays and stuff. Looks like I can keep my wife off my back. And it's good, it's good. They go a little bit overboard if you ask me. Do I take it too seriously? How would you feel if your eggs were stolen? Do I take it too seriously? I used to think that way too. But once you've been exposed to the truth, there's no going back. My brother would told you to ask me that, didn't he? It's been, um, it's been hard with my family. Joe's family's really adapted. His mother plays more than we do. Dios mío, gané! Me gusta y por eso vivo. But my family, they're so stuck in tradition. They just like clearing levels. But they could care less if they get three stars or not. I mean, I don't think they've ever recovered a golden egg. And they certainly don't care about, about killing those awful pigs. Or about getting the birds their eggs back. I admire what my brother does. I respect it. It's just not me right now. I, first of all, I, I, I have a blackberry for work. It's more practical. Second, I just can't fit in my life. There's no time for it. You know, maybe when things slow down a little bit, I'll be able to play. You know, it's just, it just doesn't fit my life right now. When do you think it will? Uh, hopefully soon. Um, yeah, soon. Obviously, Joe and I grew up together, and our family played Angry Birds casually, but I'm a words with friends person now. I find it more inclusive. Hey look, I'm playing with Cousin Bonnie in California. I like that. Yeah, Joe's sister switched to words with friends. I'm glad she's happy, but it's been hard. I mean, the pigs aren't gonna kill themselves. Today I killed 487 pigs, and I recovered 15 golden eggs. Yeah, it was a good day. <laughs> so good evening. I am Robert Kelly. I am one of the pastors here at the church. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So glad you guys came out uh, tonight uh, to join us for uh, worship services here uh, and uh, our Christmas Eve service. And uh, I uh, became an Angry Birds convert uh, a few months ago. Uh, I was innocently enough sitting in my office and Chris walks up and he says to me, Hey, have you heard about this game? I'm like, ah, oh, what game? He's a little sound, the birds. I'm like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, you got to check it out. Absolutely the best game. It's, it's breaking records. It's on everybody's, you know, iPhone or, or Android. And so I took out my nice, pretty little Android and I downloaded it. And I have been hooked. I am a player now. So I have taken this game. I have played every single level of each of the versions. And I have three stars on most of those levels. So now I, now I play. I've seen the light. This week, I was talking to one of my converts, who uh, some of you might know, he's uh, a man who you'll, you'll see kicking around mostly at the other campus, Mario Obertis. I think he's 75 or 76 or something, and now he just started playing this week. And he's got like a nook or a, a fire or something like that, and there he is. He's just, I could tell he's got the bug. He's all right. I could see it's kind of already grown with him, you know. And, you know, this is, of course, uh, you know, one of these cultural kinds of phenomena. Who, do we know, who, who would hear say is you're, you're the newest player, meaning you've just started playing in the last week or month or something. It's the first time you ever played it. Anyone? When's the first time you got, who, who's the newest player in the room? Wh when did you start, Matt? About three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Anybody can say they started before that? I mean, like after that, like more recently, anyone? That's it, is that the most recent? Nobody like picked it up today for the first time or yesterday or anything? All right, Matt, you win. There you go. <laughs> it's coming back, so someone make sure. 
All right, anybody have an idea who the youngest player? Who's the youngest player in the room? Who's we got? How we got? How old? How old? Luke. You are the youngest player, man. Play hard. I know what some of you guys are thinking. You know, you've got this idea, of course, this game is uh, a game. It can't be anything more than that. And, you know, you're a little bit too cool for a game like this. Or maybe you're too busy or maybe you're technologically challenged. I don't know what it is that you might be using as an excuse. I've been finding out there's fewer people playing it than I had even imagined. I assumed all of you were and I was last to the game. But, uh, you know, some of you might actually say, you know, I play it every once in a while. I'm not going to get too hung up, too serious about it. You know, you pick and choose it. You'll play it, you know, once, twice a year, something like that. Or maybe you just simply think, that's really not for me because it's really for kids. You obviously haven't tried it. You might also say it's even childish. Or maybe instead you think it's only for people who need that sort of a thing. Maybe that kind of a crutch in their life. And, of course, if you're talking about a game uh, like Angry Birds, then who really cares? But isn't it amazing how readily we take these same sort of attitudes into our pursuit of faith? How quickly we will become consumers of our own choice. How quickly we will decide and make judgments based upon uh, the way we interpret or understand or feel at any particular time or season. Many of us approach faith in this way. We will ignore the message that God has given to us. We will marginalize the messengers. We will maybe dabble occasionally, but never would we want to plunge in. Maybe it's not even that you're a dabbler. Maybe instead you like to pursue faith in name alone. All of us have been through these various seasons uh, in one, at one time or another in our lives. You know, the Christmas story is the beginning of the last chapter of God dealing with humanity, of calling out, of crying out to humanity. And he has been, uh, for generations, sending us a message through his messengers. He's been sending us a message uh, that, uh, well, as we read tonight, will be good news of great joy to all who will receive it. In short, you might say that God has introduced a new game. He's introduced a new game and he's asking, will you play? Will you play? We're going to be looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 1. There are Bibles throughout the room. You can feel free to open up in a Bible for our uh, Christmas meditation here this evening. Hebrews chapter 1. If you could uh, find one of those Bibles and open up to the page number there in uh, one of the brown Bibles. And right out of the gate, the writer of Hebrews, this is written 2,000 years ago. In chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. He spoke to us in all sorts of different ways through all sorts of different people. He, he sent us these messengers. Look at verse 14 of the same chapter. He says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? He sent prophets. He sent priests. He, spe- he sent angels. In fact, the Christmas story is just loaded with angels. They keep showing up, popping up everywhere. It's like they're a common occurrence, it seems, when you're reading the story. You know, because all of these messengers together were bringing this great news, great news to humanity, presenting us with a challenge. And in chapter 2 of Hebrews, this is what the writer encourages us to do. Chapter uh, 2, verse 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. You catch that? We have to pay careful attention so that we don't drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? He tells us uh, this idea of drifting away. And the, uh, the New Testament was written primarily in Greek. It's all in Greek and translated to English for us. So right from the Greek manuscripts, we get our English versions. But the Greek word here behind this idea of drifting away, picture it like you had taken your ship, in, your, your boat into safe harbor, and you had moored it, you'd anchored it, but something went wrong with the anchor. Something went wrong with the rope, with the mooring. And all of a sudden, your, your, your little boat is starting to drift into dangerous waters. That's sort of what the author is trying to capture for us. He's saying you've got to be careful. You've got to pay attention to these words that the messenger sent because if you don't, your ship will start to drift into these dangerous and hostile waters. You'll find yourself in places where you didn't mean to go. You've drifted into them and now you'll find yourself in danger. 
So we're supposed to pay attention to this, what he calls at the end of chapter 3 there, a great salvation, or in the middle, a great salvation. You know, at the, uh, in, in throughout the scriptures, you'll find an emphasis on God's word to us. We call it variously God's word, the scriptures, the Bible. It was given to us through the prophets and the angels and the messengers, but we have it now today in, in the scriptures. You know, the, the, the Bibles that you have sitting in your hands, uh, these are God's word to us. And we're encouraged to pay careful attention to these words. And some people think that this is a heavy-handed kind of thing, but when, when you start to see why we're, we ought to pay attention, you start to see the beauty and the wonder of what it is that God has done and why he has done it. And this is one of the reasons at Beacon we emphasize so often the Word of God. All of 2012, all of 2011, we did a chronological reading of the Bible. 2012, we're going to dedicate the entire year to understanding what God's Word says about our pursuit of him, our spiritual journey. We're going to look at it from a whole lot of different angles, but we're going to make the word of God the center of what we do. We would encourage any of you, I know some of you might be skeptical about it, you might be a little bit not so sure, can I even trust it, is it reliable? These are all the kinds of questions we're going to be looking at in 2012. It's the kind of a thing where if you've never actually been able to have a chance to pick it up or study a little bit, uh, it would be a great opportunity for you to do it. That's what we're going to be, be committing ourselves to because we know that this word of God is held in such high esteem. It forms the foundation of this gift, this promise that we've been given. So, all right, what is this great salvation that the writer is telling us? You might think of it really as three gifts that are being offered to us, three gifts of salvation. We're going to start in chapter 2, nine, verse 9. Where, uh, to see the first of these gifts. He says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Taste death for everyone. That's the first gift, that Christ has tasted death for everyone. That's what this table represents. That's what these elements mean to us. It's, there's, uh, there's so much packed into it, but the, the, the long and the short of it is that now, each and every person can receive forgiveness from God. He tasted death so that we would not have to, so that we might be forgiven. You know, when I, I think about this idea of forgiveness, there's so many different ways, so many things that we, we think about when, when we're, we're uh, wondering about forgiveness. It's kind of the heart of the scriptures and the Christian message, this idea of forgiveness. You know, imagine someone knowing all that you've done all that you think, all of your actions, all of the lack of things, all the, the things that you didn't do that you wish you had done, and loving you still. You're getting a sense of what forgiveness might be. There's a story uh, that's told of a mom. She was preparing, it was Christmas Eve, and she was preparing the, you know, the traditional uh, tray of cookies uh, for Santa, and you know, the, the little glass of milk, and, and so she takes the cookies and milk, and she accidentally, while she's with her little son, she drops one on the floor. So her son looks terrified. He's like, whoa. Mom picks it up and says, it'll be fine. You know, it's fine. And she goes to put it back in the tray. He's like, you, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't put it back in the tray. And so the mom says, oh, honey, don't worry about it. Santa will never know. He'll never know. And he shoots her a look. He says, he knows if I've been bad or good, but he won't know if the cookie fell on the floor. <laughs> You know, he knows whether you've been bad or good. He knows all of your secret cookies. He knows which ones you've dropped. He knows which ones, which ones you're addicted to. He knows the ones that you simply can't get enough of or form the center of your identity. He knows the ones that you feel like you can't live with or without. God knows all of these things. And he wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive you. Christ tasted death so that we would not have to. You know, maybe you're the uh, sort that is more inclined like most of us. Throughout history, there's always been a competing message to this. Most all of the world religions will tell you a simple thing. Earn your favor with God. Work hard. Earn his favor. Earn his forgiveness. You can do it because it's a self-help kind of a world. Have you guys heard recently that they've determined, the, the scientists among us, they've determined what the single most germ-infested object, item, that you will normally touch in a, in a given week. Do you know what that is? Have you heard about this? Anyone? It's the gas pump. It's the gas pump. So when you go to fill up for your long trip to your relatives today, 
just think about that. The most germ-infected surface, this is such a happy Christmas thought. You can, this most germ-infected surface is right there. None of you are carrying gloves. You know this. You're going to reach out and you're going to grab that thing. So next time you pull into that gas station and it says full serve or self-serve, you should seriously think about this. You should seriously think about this. It's only a few bucks more. I'm not really sure it's worth it because in some areas of life, it is better not to be self-serviced. It's better to have someone else do it for you. And the scriptures tell us over and over and over again, faith is not a self-service kind of a thing. It's not the way the world works. It's not the way God works with us. He has offered us a forgiveness, full and complete because Christ tasted death. The second gift of salvation is found in, in chapter 2, verse 10. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. You catch all this language? The sons, the family, the brothers. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers because God has adopted us into his family. If we have trusted in Christ to taste death for us, then we are adopted into his family. And we are never meant to experience that despair of aloneness again. You know, even the happiest moments of our lives have that tinge of loneliness. We come to the holiday season when we're happy about Christmas and the time we get to spend with our crazy families. And don't look at anyone. I see the Perlo clan over here. You're thinking, yes, the whole crazy clan. But you know, it, it, you're here. It's, a, it, it's an exciting time. But of course, you can't help but think about the lost loves the ones you wished were here, the ones that can't be anymore. You think about your new year, and you're excited, and it's a happy, it's an optimistic time, and if you know you're, it's a new year, here we go, sailing into 2012, and will that relationship work out? Will my marriage get worse, if it can get any worse? Will I be reconciled to my children, or will we forever be estranged? You see, we're, even the greatest moments of our lives are tinged with this aloneness, with this thing that aches inside of us, we're hungering for something more. And God has said, you can be adopted into my family. This is a great and an amazing gift. You know, you might say, this isn't really the kind of a family uh, that I would like to be a part of. You know, maybe, you know, you've got some other ideas as to what your family might look like and what you would pick if you could pick uh, your own uh, family. You know, maybe you think that it, he's not, God isn't offering you enough. Or maybe you're the kind of a person that says, I can't even see myself as a brother of Jesus. I'm not, I'm not worthy. I couldn't, be, I couldn't be folded into his family in this way. I, it's, it's brazen. It's arrogant to even think so. And yet that's the very promise that he gives to us. Maybe you don't, like, you don't want to be folded into his family because you don't like the house rules. Maybe you're not so sure you like the way dad runs things around here. Maybe that's what's holding you back from receiving this gift of family. You know, maybe you're just, maybe you're just embarrassed. Maybe you're, you're embarrassed that you'll show up in a video like this one day and your whole family will think you're a nut. I heard a story about a woman. She was, uh, you know, taking a shower and her little two-year-old son kind of found his way into the bathroom and he was just adorable beyond belief. He rolled himself up in the toilet paper like a mummy. You know, he just kind of like rolled it all out and she just kind of peeked out and she saw that, you know, he was rolling himself up. It was the cutest thing. So she jumps out of the shower. She grabs her camera and she, she takes the picture. It's super cute. One of the cutest pictures she's ever seen of her son. So she makes it her Christmas card. And then the phone calls start coming in. Because, of course, she didn't notice the reflection in the mirror. <laughs> where she was wearing nothing but the camera. That's what it means to be embarrassed in front of your family. And maybe you feel like, you know, if I go down this line, I start taking faith seriously. I'm going to be embarrassed in front of my family. I'm going to be ashamed. Who knows what they'll think about me. They'll think I'm one of those kinds of people. Maybe that's what's keeping you from receiving this gift from God. A third uh, uh, of uh, the gifts that is offered to us here is verse, found in verse 14. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. There's so many places we can go with this, uh, you know, that mentions the death and the devil and all this kind of crazy stuff. But take a look at that one phrase, who are held in slavery by their fear of death. Slavery. See, the scriptures give us this promise of victory over death. It's an amazing gift God offers us. An amazing gift. You know, there's good and there's evil, according to the scriptures. There's life and there's death. 
And it isn't just the kind of death that we think about, you know, the final death of our physical bodies. Because you know our entire lives are marked with death. Different types of deaths, aren't they? Isn't it true that, that each day we die in different ways just a little bit? You know, you've got a sickness. You've got a very slow kind of painful death. It's a little bit, just a little bit each day. A slow, debilitating kind of death. And God turns around and he says, I'm going to offer you peace in the midst of those trials and that pain. And wholeness as a future promise to you. You might say instead, you know, it's not that that gets me. I'm dying this sort of frustrating death as I wrestle with all of my ghosts, all of these things that tear me down, that make me less of who I want to be in this world. All of those demons that are hiding out in your life, in your closet, the ones that are ripping out my soul, those are the ones that I'm, so these are a death that I'm experiencing all the time. I'm dying to who I really want to be, who I know I ought to be in this world. You're wrestling against this, this death of sin. And the scriptures say that we can have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, that we can have holiness that comes from God, that we can be accepted into his family and see our lives transformed and turned around so that we don't live the way we used to as slaves to this kind of death. There's an existential kind of death. It's that kind of a thing where you start to ask, what does any of this matter? What does my life account for? What is it going to, if I added up the, all of it and I put it in a bucket, would there be anything there? And what comes after it? Does any of this really matter? A sort of existential death that we go through at different seasons of our lives. And the scriptures say you can have a spiritual life of hope and vitality, of a walk with God that goes beyond anything that you could have hoped or imagined. You approach physical death. And of course, the scriptures tell us the promise of the table is that we will have a resurrected life. That, 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 that death becomes just a, a, a doorway. That's it, a curtain between this world and the next world. And we can have a new hope in a resurrected life. You see, this is an amazing gift that we have been given. What we're told in uh, chapter 3, verse 12, not to harden our hearts. We're warned not to harden our hearts. Look at that. He says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily... As long as it is called today. Today is called today, by the way. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Back and down in verse 19 of that same chapter, he says, So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. This hardness of the heart is linked to our unbelief. And I certainly can, uh, this is, you know, this is one of the crosses I have to bear. I tend to be a little bit hard of heart. I can be a cynical kind of a person. My wife and I were driving down the road the other day, and we're listening to this. There's a new Christian radio station. I don't know if you guys heard about this. 96.7 K-Love, new Christian radio station. It's actually really good. I find it positive and encouraging. <laughs> so if you, if you haven't checked it out, you should. But every once in a while, they tell a story that sort of just gets under my skin. And this last time, they were telling a story. Uh, and uh, it was a woman, and it was an, amaz it was an amazing story, okay? I'm not a total jerk. But it was an amazing story about a woman who had lost 200 pounds. Pretty, her life has been totally transformed, totally changed. And she's like, I just wanted to thank you guys and Jesus for helping me lose all that weight. Okay. She just kept going on. You know, I just thank Jesus for, for losing that weight. And I said, yeah, that's, that's what I tell my wife. I'm like, yeah, that's great. You know, and, you know, thank Jesus and diet and exercise. You know, and you lost that weight. My wife looks at me. She goes, you're such a cynic. Why are you such a cynic? Who do you think gave her the willpower to lose that weight, to diet and exercise? Now, that's when a smart man would have kept his mouth shut. <laughs> and I said, well, I suppose the same person gave her the strength who gives the atheists their strength to diet and exercise. And so she just looks at me. She just casts me that knowing glare. And she says, who's the pastor here? <laughs> This is all based on the common good of God. He's blessing people in this way. And of course, I'm thinking to myself, I just to like, learn what she's going Anyway, so you know, here, hardness of heart. It's an easy thing. You see, the scriptures tell us over and over, they warn us. Will you allow your heart to be hardened? Or will you hear what God has to say to us through his messengers, through his word? You know, when you come to this place, there's a decision that you've got to make. A decision. Will you play? Will you play? Will you surrender your unbelief? Will you give it over? The hardness of our hearts is linked to our unbelief. 
Will you trust in this great salvation as a gift from God? If you did, it means you will never have to wonder again whether, you, whether or not you are forgiven, whether you are loved by God. You'll never have to question it. You'll never have to despair about the aloneness that you sense always encroaching. You'll know that you've been folded into a family, into a family not only here, but one that will last forever, for all of time. And you know then that you can live without being a slave to this fear of the many types of deaths that, that eat away at our souls. We can live with victory and overcome these things because of this great gift. We're told here in the text that we can enter into that rest. That is our hope and our prayer for all of you guys this Christmas and this year. Would you guys pray with me? Lord, we're asking uh, that you, by the power of your spirit, would draw us to yourself, soften our hearts. May we surrender uh, the coldness and the hardness that sometimes settles in. It's so easy to see it happen, Lord. I pray that you would draw us to yourself, that we would see the irresistible nature of this gift, that we would embrace it wholeheartedly and fully. Lord, we ask that you would do this through the power of the Spirit, through faith and trust in the work of Christ on our behalf. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.